The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Amanda from CCIQ and I'll be your facilitator for today. Uh, joining us is Jason Wales, our HR and IR Services Manager here at CCIQ, um, and also uh, Terence Otto, a Customer Manager at WorkCover Queensland. CCIQ has been entrusted by the Workers' Compensation Regulator of the Office of Industrial Relations to deliver free workers' compensation information service to Queensland employers. Now, part of this partnership, we are to help educate businesses on what to do when one of your workers is injured at work and also how you can support them to return to work as quickly as possible. In today's webinar, Terence is going to provide you an overview of WorkCover Queensland. It's going to step you through uh, your insurance obligations, how to maintain a safe uh, work environment and what to do when someone gets injured. And Jason will uh, jump in at the end there and give you a bit of information about our um, workers' compensation hotline and other services uh, and also run the, the Q&A at the end. So. Um, before we start, if you do have a question for either Terence or Jason, um, you can do so at any time during the webinar using the chat box that appears on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. We just had a question in already about whether today's webinar will be recorded and yes it will be and we will be sending out a copy later on along with the slides. Uh, so now I'll hand over to Terence to take you through today's presentation. So in today's session, we'll cover the basics about who WorkCover Queensland is and what, what role we play. You'll learn how, to, uh, how WorkCover protects your business and provides cover for your employees should a workplace injury occur. And we're focused on helping you stay in business and maintain your productivity. We'll talk about who is considered a worker and needs to be covered under your accident insurance policy. I'll give you some pointers around maintaining a safe workplace, what you should do if a workplace injury occurs, and steps you can take to be prepared before a claim happens. We'll also talk about our injury information pack, a fantastic guide for employers and workers, which can help you understand what's required and how you can best support your employee through a claim, and also the recovery process to achieve timely outcomes. I hope you find the session informative and practical, so let's get started. So WorkCover is an independent government-owned statutory body meaning we are governed by legislation and operate under the leadership of a board and CEO. We have been providing workers' compensation insurance in Queensland since 1997 and currently insure around 160,000 Queensland employers. Last financial year, our call centre took over 440,000 incoming calls and we accepted 67,194 workplace injury claims. This means we were able to assist over 67,000 Queensland workers to recover and provide guidance to their employers to ensure ongoing output. WorkCover Queensland is completely self-funded and strive to maintain Australia's lowest average premium rate at $1.20 through investment in fast and easy to use online customer services, an experienced in-house claims management team, which saves you time and money, as well as the sustainable premium and return to work outcomes for both employers and injured workers. We are a customer focused insurer who aims for insurance excellence. While it is mandatory for all Queensland employers to take out a work cover accident insurance policy, excluding self insurers, work cover is committed to providing a customer experience and benefits that are equal to or better than commercial insurers. Our approach is simple, build lasting valued relationships with our customers and stakeholders. This means understanding our customers needs and evolving our business processes to suit these needs. A great example of this is the recent creation of our small and new business segment, which is where I'm from. We now have a dedicated team who understands small business, providing detailed step-by-step -step assistance to small business employers and their injured workers, and delivering a service tailored to your needs. Although separate organisations, we work in partnership with the Office of Industrial Relations, and that consists of Workplace Health and Safety Queensland, the Electrical Safety Office, and the Workers' Compensation Regulator previously known as QCOM, so you may know him as QCOM there. In an effort to better support Queensland business and the broader community, WorkCover united with the Office of Industrial Relations to deliver a single point of contact via a combined website and a 1300 phone number. It's your one-stop shop for all things workplace health and safety related in Queensland. So workers' compensation is compulsory for all employers in Queensland. 
Your work cover policy covers you for medical expenses and loss of wages if a worker is unable to work either fully or partially due to a work-related injury. You will benefit from our expertise in return to work and injury management. And in Queensland, your policy also covers your workers' travel to and from work under certain circumstances. So just something to keep in mind there. So who do, you, uh, who do I need to cover? It's probably a question that many employers will ask. It's crucial to understand who is a worker under our legislation, which is the Workers' Compensation and Rehabilitation Act of 2003. By having the appropriate cover, it will ensure you avoid being liable for claims costs and potentially penalties should that person be injured at work. The legislation sets out that a worker is a person, so it needs to be an individual, who works under a contract of service and is an employee for the purpose of assessment for PAYG withholding under the Taxation Administration Act of 1953. So companies are not covered. Other specific exclusions of who is not a worker are a corporation of which the person is a director, a trust of which the person is a trustee, and a partnership of which the person is a partner. Some share farmers may be considered a worker as well as a salesperson paid by commission. Sole traders who are engaged as individuals may be deemed workers. It's important to note that an individual can be considered a worker even if they have an ABN and or they are responsible for their own tax. Even where a person calls themselves a subcontractor, if you engage them for work, they may be a worker under the Act. If you are ever unsure whether you are engaging a worker or a contractor, I highly recommend that you utilise the online ATO worker decision tool and that can be found on the ATO website or you can give us a call on our 1300 number and we can help answer your questions specifically and navigate through the information. Keep in mind that there is no single factor that will be conclusive in determining whether the person is a worker or a contractor. The totality of the working arrangements needs to be considered. Next, we'll have a look at creating a safe workplace. So while work cover's focus is managing claims for people who are injured at work, we work closely with the Office Industrial Relations to promote safe workplaces and link employers with the best tools to help them. Creating a safe workplace has many benefits for yourself, your team and your bottom line. The Workplace Health and Safety Queensland resources include risk identification, assessment and management tools, information on common industry specific safety hazards and guides on how to improve health and well-being at work. So when it comes to workplace health and well-being, Focusing on this can provide a lot of benefits holistically. It can improve productivity, engagement, absenteeism, and injury frequency among many things. So what happens if someone gets injured? In the case of a workplace injury, assist the worker in getting the necessary medical assistance immediately. It sounds simple, um, and it is simple. From there, lodge a claim with work cover, work cover either via the website over the phone or through the treating doctor as soon as possible as early intervention is key. During the claim process and throughout the recovery, talk to your worker and support them. Our No Fault Workers' Compensation Scheme means that, work, that Queensland workers have the right to apply for statutory benefits no matter who or what caused their workplace injury. Some examples of different types of injuries we cover are physical injuries such as lacerations, fractures and burns, psychiatric or psychological disorders, such as anxiety or depression, diseases including asbestosis and Q fever, aggravations of a pre-existing condition, industrial deafness, and worst case scenario, fatalities from an injury or disease. Your actions as an employer upon an injury occurring within your workplace can have a significant impact on the outcome of a claim. We recommend that you connect with your employee, take an interest in their well-being be supportive and try not to blame. An important part of a positive return to work is maintaining open and honest communication. Ensuring that they are kept up to date and supported can help prevent them from feeling isolated from their workplace and team. Encourage them to seek medical assistance as soon as possible. As I mentioned, early, uh, as I mentioned earlier, early intervention is essential in ensuring the best possible injury resolution. And notify work cover within eight days from when the injury occurred. Even if the injured party does not wish to claim, you need to report the injury to WorkCover. After a claim is lodged, WorkCover will contact you for information before we determine the claim. We also gather information from the worker 
and depending on the claim complexity, we may get that inf additional information from doctors and other people such as witnesses or even an independent medical examiner to help us make that decision. Each claim is considered based on its individual facts and relevant medical information, however, all claims are subject to a few criteria. So the first criteria is, has the claim been made within time? That is within six months of the date first seen by a doctor, dentist or nurse practitioner. Second criteria, can the person claiming be deemed a worker? Third is, was the injury caused by a work-related event? And following from there, was the person injured because of or in the course of employment? And was employment a significant contributing factor to the injury? Although we aim for a five-day decision turnaround, a decision can take up to 20 business days, especially if we have difficulty getting the information we need. If we cannot determine the claim within 20 days, we'll contact the worker to let them know that a decision has not been made and provide written reasons outlining why there was a delay. Once we've gathered enough information to make a decision on the claim, both the worker and yourself will be informed of the decision. If it is accepted and is ongoing, the claim will be transferred to a customer advisor for management. So a work-related injury can be a difficult emotional experience for all involved, and it's good to look outside of just the impact it has on yourself as an employer, as well as the worker, but also to the family and friends and also your co-workers. We're here to support recovery and achieve appropriate return to work outcomes by encouraging workers, employers, and medical and allied health providers to work in close partnership with each other and to communicate openly between all parties. Should a workplace injury occur and a claim be accepted, WorkCover encourages you to take every reasonable step to provide suitable or modified duties within the workplace. Sometimes this terminology can be confusing for workers and employers alike. A suitable duties plan simply matches tasks within the workplace with what the worker can and can't yet do, and is always approved by a treating doctor prior to commencing to ensure the program is safe. When a person returns to work on a suitable duties plan, you will need to have an understanding of the limitations. This will help you provide appropriate support and can reduce possible complications such as re-injury or other return to work issues that can compound and lengthen a claim. If someone has been injured at work, help them recover at work or return to work as soon as possible. Suitable duties don't always need to be the pre-injury role. Consider what other types of duties are available in the workplace or what projects or tasks have you wanted to do for some time but haven't had the time or people to do it. Focus on what they can do, not what they can't. We can help you source other um, tasks that are available in the workplace. And if this isn't possible, we can identify host employment opportunities until the worker can resume their original duties. WorkCover has a range of resources to help you build a sustainable, uh, sorry, a suitable duties register and identify duties for injured workers. As I mentioned earlier, we have an injury information pack available on our website and it's under rehab and claims. In the pack, it includes an information sheet for the employer and the worker a blank suitable duties register and plan, a letter template to the medical practitioner, an incident investigation form, a workers' compensation claim form, an example of a work capacity certificate so you know what to look out for. Supervisors and co-workers need to understand that injured workers, uh, need to understand the injured workers' limitations and creating a supportive culture helps considerably. When gradual adjustments take place to your worker's return to work plan, monitor these just to make sure that the worker is okay. And also tailor the plan to the individual. For example, if they cannot read or write, don't get them working on a computer. And remember to review. Gather feedback from your injured worker as this can be useful to help improve and develop your systems or processes. So here are some of the key takeaways from today's session. Firstly, this is best practice advice from Workplace Health and Safety Queensland. Manage health and safety risks in your workplace. Prepare for workplace incidents before they happen. Report serious incidents to Workplace Health and Safety Queensland. And investigate all incidents and reass reassess workplace health and safety policies, procedures and systems. And should a work-related injury occur, focus on return to work. It is a necessary step in a worker's recovery. Workers who stay at work or gradually return to work often recover more quickly and offer suitable duties to support your worker. And finally, if you employ, you need to ensure. Prevention is better than a cure. Report incidents and lodge claims early and maintaining good relationships is key. 
And as always, if you would like more information, it is available from our website, which is www.worksafe.qld.gov.au or feel free to contact us on 1300 362 128. Thank you, Terence. Um, thanks for that presentation today. Um, and for our listeners today, um, just wanted to remind you that um, CCIQ provides free workers' compensation advice through our workers' compensation helpline. Um, the number for that um, is 1300 365 855, or you can email workcoverinfo at cciq.com.au. Uh, and we sort of um, provide um, independent advice. Um, you know, we don't have any, while we do have a, a relationship with WorkCover in the Office of Industrial Relations, the, um, the advice we provide is independent. So you'd be, you know, can be rest assured that, um, you know, the advice we give won't be going up anywhere other than to yourselves and we keep um, things quite confidential. So this service is available to every employer in Queensland, regardless if you're a CCIQ member or not. So it's a great service. So I urge you to spread the word about this service and, you know, that my team of advisors are uh, uh, experienced in dealing with, you know, workers' compensation claims, you know, uh, how to manage um, return to work processes, um, reviews and appeals, and um, help you understand the steps in the process when dealing with an injured worker. Um, so now I'll get to some questions. So we have a few questions today, Terence. So um, firstly, um, we have a question and it is, how do you ensure a safe work environment for staff that work from home? That's actually a, a, a great topic. So when it comes to uh, working from home or working remotely even, um, you, you need to consider obviously um, the environment that they're working in. Is it mobile? Will they be um, transient like a, um, like a salesperson or anything like that? But if they are working at home and they're, it is in, a, in one location, I guess what you need to ensure is that you have the appropriate um, steps and cover off all bases to ensure that they are meeting the obligations working from home to mimic exactly what they're doing if they were working say in the office so if if they are working from home do they have the right desk set up do they have um, all the ergonomic equipment required to complete their role essentially if they're working from home is there any different to them working in the office all it is is a different location so i think what you need to do is ensure that you mimic what's happening in the um, at the workplace and it mimics at home, but also monitoring and just touching base with your staff to ensure that they are following those the, the right processes and just keeping an eye on them without actually essentially ba babysitting them. The people are empowered to to um, ensure that you know that they're they're doing the right thing at home, and I think it's just making sure that you're opening that dialogue and having those conversations about being safe um, wherever the location is. And just further to that, CCIQ does have a working from home policy where we um, can step you through the process you need to go through when um, you know embarking on or permitting someone to work from home. So we do have a checklist and we do encourage that you go out and do a site audit as well to ensure that, as Terence said, that the employee is actually doing the, the job they would be doing in the office but at home. So um, we, do, we can assist you in that, in that as well. So, okay, next question. Um, does WorkCover have policies available for sole traders who want to self-insure? We do. The, we, we do have those policies um, and essentially what you would need to do is um, give our contact centre a call. Um, you can get the policies set up and essentially it covers you for the, the loss of wages and uh, medical expenses just like what you would normally do if you were um, a worker for, for another, another entity. So if you call through the nicknamed WIPI policies, um, you contact our um, contact centre and they'll run through everything. You just need to have your wages to declare for the upcoming uh, financial year to, in order to get that set up. Okay, thanks, Terence. Uh, another question, are we, are we required to lodge a claim with every injury regardless of the severity? Yes, so if think of it, if, if someone does have a workplace injury um, and medical treatment um, is required, you, you are required to lodge it with WorkCover Queensland. It basically, it's best practice to, um, to ensure that it is, the information comes over to us in case there's complications with that injury. You might have a small laceration and then over time it develops into something uh, a little bit more severe. So you can lodge a notification with us, doesn't necessarily mean that it's a claim that goes anywhere, but at least we have that information at that particular point in time to ensure that we're um, 
protecting your workers for anything that might come up in the future. And Terence, you touched on um, in your presentation um, contractors, and um, you know the contractor and employer employee relationship is um, something that we get questioned about all the time because it can be quite difficult to navigate. Uh, so this question refers to relates to that, and that is, what if a person from another company and comes on the site and injures themselves on my site? Uh, what do I do there? So if you have engaged uh, another company to to work in, on on, on your side, and if you're essentially owning owning that um, particular environment and things like that, if they're employed by that other company, it would come through. Obviously, if, if a workers' compensation claim was lodged from a statutory side, it would actually be lodged against the company that they're working for. Um, so, from a workers' compensation side, you know you, you're essentially are responsible for the safety, but for when it comes to the compensation. Not, not that side. But having said that, then it's one of those things that you have to look at every single relationship um, in its entirety. Because if if there's something that might be slightly different to what you think it might be, they potentially could be considered a worker for yourself. But that 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 would be hard to to specifically pinpoint because you would have to look at the whole relationship. Terence, is there such thing as a joint claim? from a contractor and employer perspective, is that a real thing? On a statutory side, no. So um, on, on the common law side, which where there is a, a webinar in the future um, looking at um, the, the common law side, um, there, there may be aspects where that comes in, but for statutory side, no. Okay, and um, we get this question a lot too through, our, through the um, helpline. What happens if the, an organisation, company, employer doesn't have suitable duties to offer? So if there's uh, no suitable duties um, available at all, so what we'll do is try and exhaust that um, from the get-go. We, we, you know, we want to ensure that that person's going back to their, uh, their original employer the first time. Um, if there's no suitable duties available at all, we will look at other options including host placement um, and that's where we'll get a uh, an employer who has um, uh, duties that can be accommodating for the injury at hand and then we'll progress the workers rehabilitation through through that method instead okay and we have a question here relating to casuals um, are casual workers included in the return to work process they certainly are. So irrespective of whether they're part-time, full-time or casual, um, if they are a worker um, for you and they've been injured, we will um, ensure that they are part of the return to work process, no matter what. Um, this is a, a, another quite common question that we have um, received, and that is, um, what is an employer's option when uh, they've um, hired an employee who has and now injured themselves and they can't perform the inherent requirements of that role because of that injury? What steps does an employer take through work cover um, to deal with that? So if they've been injured because uh, if, if they're injured and they're no longer able to do their role because of the workplace injury, Unfortunately, any information that WorkUpper has in regards to their capacity for work can't be relied upon to look at whether or not you want to continue on their, their employment. So an employer will need to um, do their own um, checks to, to ensure whether or not that person can perform the tasks that they were hired to do. Um, keep in mind, yeah, any information from WorkHover is um, because of the work-related injury and their capacity moving forward can't be utilised for um, their industrial side of things, whether or not they continue with that employer or, or, or not. And I guess that's where um, we come into that play, into that situation, CCIQ. We can provide advice, further advice on how to manage uh, an employee who's been injured and, and can no longer um, perform their inherent requirements of the role. We can um, certainly help um, employers with that situation, provide further context and clarity around that. So um, next question. Um, Okay, what about work experience and volunteers? Uh, what happens um, when managing claims with unpaid employees? Are they still classified as workers under the Act? Uh, in 
some circumstances they could be if you have a um, con contract of insurance. So the best way to think of it is like uh, lifesavers. They, they have a particular policy that covers them and they're, they're volunteer workers. Um, but generally speaking, if they are a volunteer, um, then that would fall under uh, different insurance. When it comes to work experience, you can have a, a specific policy that covers um, certain aspects if someone was injured um, in, in that space as well. Um, I think this question is going to be um, very um, important to most of our listeners and that is when an employee lodges a claim uh, and you go through the decision process and you sub submit all the evidence and documentation and WorkCover approves that claim, what recourse does an employer have and what can they request on, you know, when it comes to, you know, um, objecting to that, um, that approval? So if an employer is aggrieved by the initial decision to accept a claim um, by WorkCover, you, what you'll need to do is request a reasons for, for decision from WorkCover. So the person who made the decision on a claim will issue with a document. You'll commonly hear, um, hear it to be referred to as an RFD, reasons for decision. And that, that document will outline how we came to the decision on the claim. It'll also provide information down the bottom to advise on how to take the next steps, which is to go through a review process through the workers' compensation regulator. So pretty much that's the document that's key to, to move things forward. Keep in mind though that there are specific timeframes in order for you to requ request the reasons for decision and also to take the appropriate steps. So if you are aggrieved by decision, um, sooner is um, better than later in order for you to, to get that process rolling. I guess the key take home message there is that um, the work cover claims process is governed by timeframes and timelines and um, you know employers need to be mindful of those timelines when um, you know responding to a claim and of course requesting additional information such as the RFD so it's very important that um, you know employers um, keep to those timeframes if you if you don't submit or request information in a timely manner you could lose the opportunity to progress your um, your claim further or your defense of a, of a claim further is that right that's right. Yeah. So even when I mentioned earlier, even even when it comes to just say you're not aggrieved by the decision and you want to help um, the worker back to work, you know, um, early intervention is key, and that also goes in, into practice for like you you're aggrieved by the decision, like you need to need to jump in so we can look at things a little bit sooner rather than later. Uh, this question relates to mental health. Um, is mental health or a mental health injury treated differently um, um, to any other um, injury at work? Under our Act, there is one thing that we do need to consider when it comes to a psychological injury, and that is whether the um, employment was the major significant contributing factor. Um, so for all other injuries, it just needs to be the employment just needs to be the significant contributing factor, but for psychological needs employment needs to be the major significant contributing factor. So we still look at the same aspects um, for a psychological injury um, and during the process of a, um, the, for the claim to be determined, we may be able to provide assistance um, by, by tapping into different services for that worker um, and they can utilise uh, free services to, to support them um, with their mental health and um, that's not actually um, against the, your, your policy or anything like that. But we do look at the claims slightly different but overall there's, there's pretty much the same information that we're looking for. Now this question relates to managing employee entitlements um, during a claim. So whilst the claim is um, awaiting approval, um, is the employer required to um, continue to pay the employee? And if so, how are they paying them while the claim is being assessed? So the, the moment someone's injured, um, basically whilst the claim is still pending um, we, and we haven't made a decision on the claim, the employer will would go about with what they would normally do. So if it's a, uh, a full-time employer, a full-time employee that has um, sick leave entitlements, you know, they, if, if this wasn't a work cover claim, what would they normally do? And they would probably access those, those um, entitlements there. And the same for, for casual, uh, sorry, for, for part-time um, workers too. So you would go about up, up until the point that we make the decision on the claim. Once we made the decision on the claim, then we need to have a look at, okay, do we need to, um, payback for the period that um, entitlements were paid out or you know if the claim was rejected then then we move forward from there so you would you would go about what you would normally do if work cover wasn't involved 
Okay, we've got time for one last question and um, once again it reverts to um, contractors and labour hire. So, um, you know, is a, a, a labour hire employee um, included under the cover even if they're just, um, you know, employed for one day, just utilised for one day? So if you engage um, a company that provides you with services through a labour uh, through labour hire, the person the the person if they injured themselves at work, the labour hire company is actually responsible for for them and their compensation. So they would actually fall under the labour hire's policy, and um, we would actually look at it through through that avenue because the if they're working for a third party and you're the employer that's engaged the labour hire um, the company to provide those services, you're you're essentially a third party to the claim. You're the host employer, if if you'd like to think of it like that. And, and once again, there's no such thing as a, a joint claim in in um, the workers' compensation legislation, but common law there could be. That is that right? That's correct. Yep. Okay, Terence, you've done a wonderful job today and we thank you very much for coming in. Um, we um, still have a lot of questions, but unfortunately we're running out of time. Um, if I could just take um, one moment to um, once again um, you know, advise everybody that um, CCIQ does have a free workers' compensation helpline and this is available to every employer in Queensland. So please give us a call on 1300 365 855 if you have any questions regarding workers' compensation, managing ill or injured employees, rehabilitation return to work. It's a free service, um, so please give us a call. So I'll now just hand you back over to Amanda uh, to close out today's uh, webinar. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much to both Terence and Jason. We, yeah, sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions. Um, we all we will be running another work cover webinar scheduled for May, um, and this will be around suitable duties. So please make sure you check our website, um, and if you need to subscribe to our weekly and event weekly webinars and events newsletter, uh, get in contact with us so as soon as that's launched you'll be able to register for that one. Also our employer assistance team is running um, a few webinars as well over the next few months. Um, first one, the top five most common HR mistakes, um, contract reviews and also bond and award changes. So we'll send you an email um, that has links to all those webinars to register for. We'll also send you a link to the request recording and the webinar slides as well as um, any other resources that Terence has mentioned today. Thank you again for you both for presenting. Thank you for everyone for joining us and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.